point, which isn't enough money to pay for daycare for my kids, right? I need an, a, an actual real job. And she was smart and she was talented and she was, you know, she was, she had all of this to give and all of this awesomeness about her, but she was just stuck in a bad place. And they were like, you have to get a job. And she's like, Oh, do I like, like, how do I, how do I do that? Like really? So part of it was advocacy for sure. Part of it was me advocating on her behalf. Um, you know, with, with a community worker who, I mean, thank God, most of them are beautiful souls that are awesome and willing to work with you. Right. Um, but it was also, yeah, it was also her realizing like, okay, I can do two things at once that will help. I can do these things and, and, and make it work, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a piece around, again, that not the hard and fast lines, not the either, or it's like, I, I mean, that's yet another technology thing that I'm starting to be really intrigued by this idea that the work day, because of, because of the internet, the workday is no longer nine to five and you can, you can create schedules based around your own natural rhythms or your sport or your children, or depending on whatever it is that allows you so much more freedom now in the workplace to, to get work done. It's incredible. Well, and it also allows someone like me to branch out of Halifax, right? You know, Halifax is small, like I said, so I can have a conversation with someone anywhere in the world. I can spread some of this little magic millennial stuff wherever I want because of the magic of the internet, right? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. It's become, you know, it really has become a global marketplace for millennials, a global workplace, basically, right? And uh, that, that, that really, especially even with remote work, like I could, I could work from anywhere. Um, and, and I, I love that. And I think that more and more, um, that, that means that it opens the doors for, you know, and again, I, I know I'm going back to it a little bit, but it, it opens the doors for communities that are rural and maybe you don't want to leave, but you want to do something that's not working at the, biggest farm in the province down the street from, you know, where you grew up. Um, but maybe you, you're an amazing designer and you can work remotely with a freelance team or with a design company because you have a, a great internet connection, you know, like those sorts of things are awesome. And I think, I don't know. I think the other thing is getting back to both. And one more time is one of my best stories about career coaching was I had someone come in and say, I have to quit my job. That's why I want to see you. And we get into our minds. I have to do this. I need to do this. I need to do that. And she wanted to quit her job um, because she didn't feel like she was using her, her talents. And then uh, we delved a little bit deeper and we realized that, well, she never asked them. <laughs> she never said, I'm talented at this and you guys don't know. Um, can, can I, can I do this side project where I can prove it to you? And then she did. And then they created a different position for her based around that particular talent. So she was in the right place. She just didn't realize it and she didn't ask, you know? So I don't know. I, I guess there's, lo there's so many possibilities. I think there's a really interesting relationship that you've just highlighted between storytelling, the stories we tell ourselves how those stories change when we tell them to a career counselor who's reflecting back and also the ways in which we um, can use storytelling as a way to advocate for our own selves. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more actually about storytelling process and why you chose that as a method that works really effectively with your clients. Well, Part of it is that um, it's so much more engaging than getting a test where you have to click a bunch of multiple choice boxes and it tells you you are this type of personality or you are a, you know, an H500 blue color or something, right? Um, you're like, those tests are, are interesting because they're part of the data, but they're not your core, right? And so it, it it's really engaging 
to just hear hear a story and then reflect back to them. Okay, this is what I'm hearing. Here's a strength that I noticed from you telling that story. Here's a desire. Is that still a desire or was that a big desire during that period of your life? It seems like this person was a huge influence on you. Um, is that person still in your life? And are they still influencing you in that negative way? For example, let's say it was a negative story. And like, wow, it seems like you um, really hate Excel and uh, you have to use Excel every day and you hate Excel and you're really good at it. Um, but you don't want to use Excel anymore in your new job that you're looking for right now. I see Excel is on your resume. Why don't we take that off? <laughs> Sometimes it's as simple as that. It's, it's as simple as sort of like, you know, I think to a lot of times we tell our stories and nothing happens with them. So a narrative approach isn't just you tell me a story about a time that you were at work or you tell me a story about a time you volunteered or when you were a kid. Narrative actually takes data from your story. It takes data from your experience and we use that data to reflect and move forward and make choices and get clarity and explore, right? So it's a really engaging, really personal, really empathetic way of getting data from you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally, I completely love that approach myself and I see it and I see it work. Like I love the Savikas method. I've used it before and I'm always surprised at, at the kinds of things that people start to talk about that has been, the way I think about it is it's been latent within them or passive, but by the act of storytelling and sharing and having to manifest it for someone else, it suddenly makes it much more active, dynamic, and you can start to, as you say, use it for a purpose. You can collect data, you can move forward, you can create action plans, and that's super exciting. Um, I was really curious for you in your personal career journey. I mean, you went from having very um, safe, I guess, or trusted positions in government, in recruiting, I mean, very solid, safe, for all time jobs. And all of a sudden, you must have had some kind of an aha moment, where you gave it all up, you know, through caution to the wind and started your own business. I mean, mm -hmm. tell us about how did that happen? What did you decide? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because it wasn't one moment. It was a series. It was a series of uh, seeing my friends leave <laughs> the province. It was a series of seeing how some of the major institutions, some of the big employers, some of the some of those really stable jobs are still you know, they're still really black and white boxes and black and white places. And um, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm kind of a keener. <laughs> I'm a very creative person. I'm very, we'll use the word dynamic. Um, and I have lots of ideas. And I knew, I knew after so many experiences that if I really wanted to run with my passion and I wanted to run with my ideas and I wanted to really make a difference, I needed to have way more control over my day-to-day -day tasks, right? Over what I choose to put my energy into day-to-day -day so that I could see forward movement. There are so many barriers. There's so much red tape to moving forward at all. And I will give you a great example. I was sitting down with a friend who had volunteered for an organization for a year. And it was a volunteer run organization with a board where you had to like interview to get on the board. She had poured her heart and soul into this organization. And she was she was like, you know, part of a team and she was doing a lot of stuff, but she was, she was clearly like she had taken a leadership role, even though she wasn't technically a leader and she didn't have the title, right? She interviewed for, the, for um, a board position, didn't get it, which was shocking. Um, and what they did, and this is a group of her peers, what they did was they sent an email that was a very professional Dear John letter. It didn't say, you know, hey, 
we recognize and value the fact that you have been awesome and a rock star volunteer all year. You didn't get the board position for these reasons or like it wasn't a good fit or whatever. They just sent her, you know, we've had a lot of applications and unfortunately you were not selected. Professional babble, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh my God, there are millennials out there that think this is okay. Like, are you yeah. kidding me? This system is broken. And I remember thinking, like, I can try to change this even in my little corner of the world. Let me try here in Halifax. Let me try to see if I can make a difference here, to see if people are actually going to listen and kind of get engaged with what I'm saying and what I'm trying to do. And if it works here in Halifax, maybe it'll work out there, right? Maybe I can find other people that feel this way, other career professionals that are using these post modern tools that know the system is broken and they want to help. And boy, have I like, it's been amazing. Right. But working, working in my nine to five job, I didn't have those opportunities to network, to get out there, to say exactly what I felt that wasn't necessarily in line with what the center might feel to like, uh, as, uh, as an entrepreneur, like whether it sinks me or sails me, I can say whatever I want. Right. Um, so it was a series of events kind of like that. The not in my backyard conversations with employers that say that they're disability friendly. The awkward professional email that you get, you know, like that, that was a, a bit of a clincher, like just different things. Um, and, and that I knew there was a better way. Yeah. A series of events. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you've read the, I'm sure you have read the Millennial Tribes study. One of the things that really struck me about it was how many millennials were um, isolated. So there was yeah. one in six of millennials out there today who did not feel like they had a personal network, a family network, friend network, or professional network that was there to support them. And I found that statistic so shocking. And it really struck me that I, I believe that there is a global need for the kind of service that you're offering, which is really a um, not let me tell you about how millennials work, but let me open up the millennial mindset to you so you too can enter in and benefit and be enlarged and, and become inclusive and advocate for the rights of all people to find meaning in their profession. I know, like I have so many, whether, again, whether it's good or ill, boy, me saying I'm a millennial career coach is a conversation starter at any event, right? Yes. And I, I get, you know, like I, I, I wanted to joke at the beginning, like one of my magic words is not don't be so entitled. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the magic word is not a uh, suck it up princess, right? Like the, the magic words are, are actually kind of about, yeah, like what is so wrong? with wanting to be happy, valued, recognized, and have meaningful work. What's, what's wrong about that, right? Yeah, like, totally agree. that's a millennial value that people are like, you're entitled. Mm, I'm entitled to respect and validation at work for the work I'm putting in, really? Is that entitled? Or is that just like common human decency? And it's like, I think, I think in the older generation, like my grandfather's generation, you, did your job and you were rewarded. You got your gold watch and you were rewarded, you know, with loyalty, with a pension, with, um, I don't know, just, just with respect, you know, from, from the people that you worked with. And then, well, like that's gone. That is gone. There are so few actual ladders to climb. I mean, in some of the professional fields, like, you know, um, accountant, there's still a ladder there. Lawyer, there's still a ladder there. But there are so many ladders that are gone, you know? And the world of work has to change because we have changed. You know, the world has changed. And yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think getting that, that, that word out there um, is good. And, you know, you know, you kind of hit on another one of my magic words, which is connect. One of the things that I, that I really work with my clients on is connecting with not just the movers and the shakers in your field, but with other people that are, that are doing that work or with, 
people in your support network. You need 